Imagine a girl holding a special gun that can shoot tachyon bullets. Tachyons are hypothetical particles that can travel faster than the speed of light. She's standing some distance away from a guy facing him. Now, she shoots a tachyon bullet towards the guy. This tachyon bullet is unique because as it travels, it emits flashes of light along its path. These flashes of light are what we can see as observers. To make things easier, let's say it emits a total of 10 flashes of light as it moves. From the girl's perspective, she sees these flashes of light happening very quickly, almost instantly, one after the other. It's so fast that she sees flash hash 1, hash 2, hash 3, and so on in rapid succession. In her view, it's like the bullet is causing these flashes of light in a split second and the guy is instantly killed. Now let's switch to the guy's point of view. Since the tachyon bullet travels faster than light, something peculiar happens. The light emitted by the bullet when it first leaves the gun takes much longer to reach the guy compared to the light emitted when it enters his chest. So from the guy's perspective, he sees things in reverse. He first sees the last flash of light emitted by the bullet, and then he sees the previous ones in reverse order. It's like he sees flash hash 10 first, then hash 9, hash 8, and so on, until he finally sees flash hash 1. Here's where it gets really strange. From the guy's point of view, he sees himself getting hit and killed by the bullet even before he sees the bullet leaving the girl's gun. This paradox challenges our understanding of cause and effect, and the flow of time because in this scenario, the guy is dead before he sees the bullet fired. It's a mind-boggling concept that arises from the hypothetical nature of tachyons, particles that supposedly move faster than light and create these unusual effects. In the Buchegi Mountains of Romania, a mysterious discovery was made in 2003. This discovery is shrouded in secrecy and raises many questions. In a remote and almost uninhabited area of the Buchegi Mountains, two climbers stumbled upon strange signs carved into stone. These signs appeared ancient and eroded by time. When one of the climbers picked up a strange yellow object resembling a chain, it vanished before their eyes. This event led to a series of events involving local authorities, the military, and even political figures. The rock containing the signs was eventually examined by experts and scientists, but the meaning of these enigmatic symbols remained elusive. It was clear that this discovery was of great significance and had the potential to rewrite history. Further investigations revealed the existence of a massive tunnel inside the mountain, detected by Pentagon spy satellites. This tunnel had a precise geometric structure, and its purpose was unclear. It was protected by energy barriers that proved fatal to those who ventured too close. The discovery in Romania was linked to a similar structure found in Iraq, and the activation of one energy barrier seemed to affect the other. This raised questions about a global network of underground structures. Inside the mountain, a vast chamber contained numerous stone tables, covered in inscriptions resembling ancient cuneiform. These tables emitted fluorescent light and depicted holographic images related to various scientific fields. One table displayed information about genetic combinations, showing potential compatibility between different species. Another holographic projection revealed the true history of humanity, challenging established theories like Darwin's evolution. A control panel was discovered with levers and buttons. Among them was a red button that, when pressed, showed a holographic projection of Earth's water, receding to reveal a hidden landmass. This suggested a level of control over natural elements. In the chamber, there was also an amphora containing monatomic gold powder, believed to have properties that could enhance human longevity and energy. The central area of the chamber featured three tunnels leading to different parts of the world, including Egypt, Tibet, and a central tunnel leading deep within the Earth's crust. This discovery has far-reaching implications, challenging our understanding of history, science, and the origins of humanity. While many questions remain unanswered, it's clear that this enigmatic find in the Buchegi Mountains holds the key to a hidden chapter in our world's history. And Sisyphus is happy. Albert Camus introduces the concept of absurdity, which arises from humanity's desire to find meaning in a universe that remains indifferent. 
He argues that this realization of life's absurdity should not lead to suicide, but rather to a state of revolt. Camus uses the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus, a figure condemned to endlessly roll a boulder uphill, only to watch it roll back down, as a metaphor for the repetitive and seemingly meaningless tasks in human existence. Camus believes that various philosophers, including Kierkegaard, Shestoff, and Husserl, fall into philosophical suicide by seeking solace in faith or abstract truth, which contradicts the fundamental absurdity of life. Instead, Camus suggests that one should live with the contradiction between human reason and the unreasonable world, embracing the freedom that arises from the absence of eternal hope. This freedom allows individuals to extract value from the present moment. He argues that ethical rules do not apply to the absurd man, and examples like Don Juan, the actor, and the conqueror illustrate how one can embrace an absurd life. Absurd art, according to Camus, refrains from judgment and hope, describing the world's experiences. He criticizes Dostoevsky's works for ultimately finding hope, which, in his view, deviates from true absurdity. Camus concludes by exploring the myth of Sisyphus further, highlighting how Sisyphus's acceptance of his eternal, pointless task symbolizes finding happiness in the struggle, even in the face of life's inherent meaninglessness. In summary, Sisyphus is Happy presents Albert Camus's philosophy of absurdity through the lens of the Sisyphus myth, emphasizing the importance of rebellion and the pursuit of happiness in the face of life's apparent lack of meaning. The Vapor Canopy Hypothesis, a theory suggesting that Earth's water existed as vapor in the atmosphere before Noah's flood, raises some scientific challenges. According to this hypothesis, the water vapor would have to condense into rain, flooding the Earth. However, there are significant issues with this idea. The Earth's atmosphere is held in place by gravity, creating a hydrostatic pressure that decreases with altitude. At sea level, the air pressure is about 14.5 pounds per square inch, equal to the weight of the air in a 1 inch square column extending to the top of the atmosphere. On top of Mount Everest, the pressure is lower due to the shorter column of air above it. If a vapor canopy existed, it would be a substantial part of the pre-flood atmosphere and would need to condense into 9 kilometers of liquid water. The pressure at the Earth's surface would be equivalent to 900 atmospheres, similar to the pressure 9 kilometers deep in the ocean, with the atmosphere being mostly water vapor. For this vapor canopy to remain as vapor and not condense, the temperature would have to be elevated to the point where the partial pressure of water equals 900 atmospheres, which is the boiling point at that pressure. This would mean that Noah and his family would be living in an environment akin to a 13,000 psi boiler, which raises questions about its credibility. Additionally, the hypothesis would have implications for carbon-14 dating. While the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that such a canopy would affect C-14 dating is correct, it would also have many other observable effects on solar and thermal radiation and climate. However, no such effects are evident in the paleoclimatic record. Various dating methods including dendrochronology, thermoluminescence dating, fission track dating, amino acid dating, and uranium thorium dating confirm C14 dates for humans during the last ice age within 20%. If the vapor canopy had existed until 4,000 years ago, as suggested, these dating methods would not yield consistent results. Yet the observed evidence does not support this scenario. The Blue Planet Project is a collection of alleged classified documents that surfaced on the internet. These documents are said to contain information about extraterrestrial life, UFOs, and secret government projects related to them. What makes it peculiar is the mystery surrounding its origins and authenticity. While some believe it's a genuine leak, others consider it an elaborate hoax. Regardless, it has captured the curiosity of conspiracy theorists and UFO enthusiasts, making it a notable oddity on the internet. Perhaps what is most notable about this project is the Pulsar Project, which contains personal notes and a scientific diary. It is believed to be the work of a scientist hired by the government for a mission involving crash sites, interrogating alien life forms, and analyzing data related to these activities. 
The scientist who compiled these notes was almost terminated by the government, but managed to go into hiding abroad. His involvement in these investigations spanned over 33 years, beginning in the late 1950s and ending in 1990. The document discusses various aspects of alien encounters and research, including alien pharmacology for humans. In the ever-evolving landscape of modern medicine, technology has ushered in a profound transformation in how we perceive the human body. Two intriguing concepts have emerged from this shift, the cyborg and the cyberbody. These notions, both rooted in the post-body era, represent unique facets of our evolving relationship with technology. The cyborg, in its original form, is intimately tied to the biological world, encapsulating the intricate web of cells, neurons, and vital processes that constitute our organic existence. It's a bridge between the biological and the technological, blurring the lines that once defined us as purely human. In contrast, the cyberbody takes a leap into the realm of the wireless and the inorganic. Composed of pure informational bits, it is a departure from the biological, signaling a profound departure from our traditional understanding of the human form. Both concepts, however, share the idea that our sense of self has become mediated by technology. This shift is only set to intensify with the emergence of ambient intelligence technology, a vision where intelligent interfaces permeate everyday objects, creating an environment that responds to our presence in a seamless, invisible manner. It's a world where technology becomes an integral part of our daily lives, blurring the boundaries between the physical and the digital. In this envisioned future, the digital me takes center stage, a virtual representation of the individual, seamlessly integrating all diagnostic and clinical data across time. It's a concept that promises a new era in healthcare, where early procedures and diagnoses are conducted remotely, heralding a revolution in medical practice. However, amid these promising developments, there are concerns. The risk of dehumanization looms large as we become increasingly intertwined with technology, potentially reducing the human experience to a collection of vital statistics. Moreover, the ease of self-diagnosis facilitated by wearable biometric devices presents its own set of challenges. The May Day mystery is a puzzle tied to May 1st, also known as May Day. It centers around a series of complex pages printed in the Arizona Daily Wildcat, the student-run newspaper at the University of Arizona. These pages contain cryptic clues, keywords, and dates, along with references to historical figures and events. They also include mathematical symbols and encodings, reflecting the author's fascination with informational systems. The author appears to have financial resources, as running full-page ads in the newspaper for over a decade is not cheap. This suggests they may be older, or an established professional. The puzzle is connected to the Tucson area and the University of Arizona campus, though this isn't immediately evident from the clues. There are references to a safe deposit box in downtown Tucson, hinting at a potential reward or endpoint to the puzzle. The Mayday mystery is meticulously organized and systematic, ruling out the idea of it being the work of an irrational individual. The webmaster promises to share all information they gather and will try to do so promptly within their schedule. They also plan to handle any potential reward in a way that doesn't upset others. Ultimately, the Mayday mystery remains an enigma, with the author's intentions and the puzzle's endpoint still unknown. Aristotle introduced the idea of the unmoved mover, a fundamental concept in his philosophy. Think of it like the first domino in a line of dominoes. When you push the first domino, it sets off a chain reaction of falling dominoes. In this analogy, the unmoved mover is like that very first domino. The unmoved mover is the ultimate cause or source of all motion in the universe. Unlike everything else, it doesn't need a prior cause to set it in motion. It's unchanging, eternal, and focused on self-contemplation much like a domino that never falls by itself but starts the entire chain of motion. Aristotle used the unmoved mover to explain the order and harmony in the world. He believed that to maintain this order, 
There must be an immortal and unchanging being responsible for it all, just as the first domino initiates the motion of the others. In Aristotle's cosmology, he envisioned individual unmoved movers for each celestial sphere guiding their circular motions, much like how each falling domino influences the next in line. These unmoved movers aren't like traditional causes, but serve as final causes, inspiring motion rather than directly propelling it. They exist beyond the celestial spheres, are immaterial, and engage in intellectual contemplation, with the highest activity being contemplation itself. Aristotle's cosmological argument aimed to support the idea of an eternal cosmos, where an unmoved eternal substance drives all natural motions, much like the first domino's push initiates the entire chain reaction. Aristotle's ideas influenced later philosophers, theologians, and scholars in various cultures, but not everyone embraced his concepts, leading to different theological developments, notably within Protestantism. Transurfing of reality is an intriguing concept that offers a unique perspective on how we perceive and interact with the world around us. At its core, transurfing is a model for understanding and influencing the reality we experience. In essence, it's a model that allows you to see and influence the world. It's based on several key principles. The space of variations. The world is like a vast tree with infinite branches representing different possible variations. Your thoughts emit mental energy that aligns you with specific branches, materializing the corresponding reality. Pendulums. People who think alike create thought structures called pendulums. These can be religious, political, or even materialistic in nature. Pendulums feed on the mental energy of their followers. To break free, acknowledge their existence, stay calm, and don't engage. The wave of luck. Positive thinking and nurturing small successes create a cascade of luck. Negative thinking does the opposite. Excessive potentials. Giving too much importance to something distorts your perception of reality. Reducing importance helps regain balance. Induce transition. Negative emotions and reactions can pull you into negative life scenarios. Avoid negative information and stay indifferent. Russell of Morning Stars. Listen to your intuition and inner discomfort when making decisions. The current of variations. Don't beg, demand, or fight for your desires. Instead, express your intention and act harmoniously with the flow of life. Intent. Focus on the goal and act with determination. Inner and external intentions should align. Slides. Negative self-images, or slides, can affect your reality. Create positive slides and visualize them regularly. Visualization, focus on the process of moving toward your goal, not just the goal itself. The soul frail, embrace your individuality and follow your own path rather than conforming to societal standards. Goals and doors, pursue what truly brings you joy and happiness, not someone else's goals or societal expectations. Transurfing offers a unique perspective on shaping your reality, emphasizing the importance of aligning your thoughts, intentions, and actions with your true desires while avoiding the traps of pendulums and excessive potentials. Holonomic brain theory is a way of thinking about how our brains work. It suggests that our consciousness, or the way we think and feel, is influenced by very tiny things happening inside our brain cells. These tiny things are related to a special type of math called holonomy. Imagine your brain as a big puzzle. Traditional science looks at the pieces of the puzzle, neurons and chemicals, to understand how the brain works. But holonomic brain theory looks at the whole puzzle differently. In this theory, our brain is like a special kind of picture called a hologram. In a hologram, if you cut a small piece out, that small piece still contains the whole picture. Similarly, in our brain, even small parts of it can hold all our memories and thoughts. This theory also suggests that our brain doesn't store memories in one specific place. Instead, it spreads memories all over like a spider's web. This makes our brain very good at remembering things and connecting ideas, even when parts of it are damaged or removed. To understand this better, think of how sunlight shines through a window. 
even if the window is small, it can still show everything outside. In the same way, our brain stores information in a way that even small parts can hold all the important stuff. This theory also talks about how our brain uses special patterns and waves to remember things. These patterns are like ripples in a pond when you throw a pebble in. They help our brain remember and recognize things, even when they look a bit different. So, holonomic brain theory is like a new way of thinking about how our brain works, where memories are spread out and connected in a special way, like pieces of a puzzle or ripples in a pond. It helps explain how our brain can do amazing things, even when parts of it are missing or damaged. Russian scientific research has uncovered fascinating connections between our DNA and various phenomena like clairvoyance, intuition, healing, and more. They've shown that DNA can be influenced by words and frequencies without the need for genetic editing. This is because DNA contains both our physical blueprint and a means of communication. Typically, only 10% of DNA is considered important for building proteins while the rest is labeled as junk DNA. Russian researchers, however, believe this so-called junk DNA plays a significant role in our communication and follows language-like rules. Scientists have also explored how DNA responds to vibrations. They found that DNA behaves like a solitonic, holographic computer, influenced by laser radiation and language modulation. This means words and sentences can affect DNA without the need for genetic editing. This research explains why techniques like affirmations, hypnosis, and meditation can have strong effects on our bodies. These methods tap into our DNA's ability to respond to language and vibrations. Moreover, DNA can transmit information patterns even to other DNA, leading to cellular reprogramming. This transformation occurs without the usual gene editing processes. Russian scientists have also discovered that DNA can create magnetized wormholes that transmit information beyond space and time. Hypercommunication through DNA is most effective in relaxed states and can explain phenomena like telepathy and remote sensing. In the past, humans may have had stronger group consciousness, but individuality led to a loss of hypercommunication abilities. Today, some individuals, particularly children, exhibit signs of regaining these capabilities, which could transform humanity's understanding and abilities. Furthermore, DNA appears to be an organic superconductor, capable of storing information at room temperature. It also influences the formation of vacuum domains, self-radiant balls of ionized gas with significant energy. These vacuum domains can be guided by thought and may be responsible for various phenomena, including UFO sightings. In ancient and medieval times, ether, also known as the fifth element or quintessence, was believed to fill the universe beyond the earth. It was thought to explain natural phenomena like the propagation of light and gravity. While once considered a medium for light in space, it was later challenged by the Michelson-Morley experiment, suggesting it doesn't exist. Ether's mythological origins trace back to Greek mythology, where it represented pure air or the essence of the gods. It was personified as Ether, the son of Erebus and Nyx. The concept evolved over time, and Aristotle introduced it as the fifth element, distinct from the terrestrial elements, attributing circular motion to celestial spheres made of ether. Medieval scholars believed ether had varying densities, with celestial bodies denser than the rest of the universe. Robert Flood even described it as subtler than light. Quintessence, a Latin term for the fifth element, gained popularity in medieval alchemy. It was thought to have healing properties, with alchemists using it in elixirs and medicines. In the 18th century, ether theories were developed to explain electromagnetic and gravitational forces. Newton used ether to match observations with his physics, although later developments rendered these theories obsolete. Some contemporary physicists still explore ether-like concepts to address gaps in current models, such as dark energy. Luminiferous ether was a theory explaining light's motion, involving ether-filled space with tiny whirlpools transmitting light vibrations. This idea influenced the wave theory of light, but was later replaced by more accurate models. Ether was also considered in early gravitational theories. 
Jacob Bernoulli associated ether with the hardness of bodies, and Isaac Newton proposed ether as the medium through which gravity acted. Newton's ether model described its circulation and density gradients, explaining the force of gravity in a non-mechanical way. Despite later changes to his theory, Newton's ether model laid the foundation for our modern understanding of gravity. In 1968, Victor Schumann introduced the concept of a culture of health. This idea revolves around the belief that culture, comprising spiritual, mental, and physical aspects, directly influences human health. In turn, health, encompassing spiritual, mental, and physical well-being, is essential for achieving a higher level of culture. The culture of health aims to implement innovative health programs that promote a holistic approach to well-being, encompassing physical, mental, and spiritual dimensions. Victor Schumann was elected as the president founder of the World Organization of Culture of Health in 1994, overseeing the international social movement to health via culture. This organization operates in alignment with registered charters and focuses on innovative health programs that support holistic well-being, both within and outside the workplace. Schumann also became the first editor-in-chief of the journal To Health via Culture in 1995, published by the World Organization of Culture of Health. This journal received an International Standard Serial Number ISSN, and has its publishing house. The core idea of a culture of health is to implement innovative health programs that advocate for holistic well-being inside and outside work environments. According to Professor N. Griebuck, the culture of health should be viewed as an integral part of spiritual, moral, labor, recreation, personality, and relationship cultures. It's not merely the connection of culture and health, but their synthesis, creating a new quality. This approach involves developing the spiritual, mental, and physical capacities of individuals. The culture of health emphasizes three main aspects, physical health, achieved through hygiene, physical activity, and nutrition, psychical health, involving mental hygiene and emotional well-being, and spiritual health, dependent on realizing one's potential and embracing cultural and spiritual wealth. In the United States, Cultural competency in medical practice and health policy is gaining importance in a diverse society. Several states, including California, New Jersey, New Mexico, Washington, and Ohio, have enacted laws mandating cultural competency training for medical professionals. This recognizes the need for healthcare providers to understand and respect diverse cultural backgrounds. Additionally, the use of multimedia, television, the internet, and wireless technology is helping disseminate health information to a wider audience, contributing to the spread of the culture of health. Synesthesia is a phenomenon where stimulation in one sensory or cognitive pathway triggers involuntary experiences in another. For instance, some people may see colors when listening to music or associate specific colors with letters and numbers. These individuals are known as synesthetes, and their experiences vary based on their unique life experiences and the specific type of synesthesia they have. One common form of synesthesia is grapheme color synesthesia, where letters or numbers are perceived as having inherent colors. Another type is spatial sequence synesthesia, where numbers, months, or days elicit precise spatial locations or three-dimensional maps. Synesthesia can manifest in various combinations and senses, making it diverse and fascinating. The development of synesthesia is not fully understood, but it's thought to occur during childhood when children first encounter abstract concepts. The most common types of synesthesia, like grapheme color, tend to be related to concepts children encounter early in their education. The earliest recorded case of synesthesia dates back to John Locke in 1690, but there is debate over whether he described a true instance of synesthesia. The first medical account came from German physician Georg Tobias Ludwig Sachs in 1812. There are two main forms of synesthesia, projective and associative. Projective synesthetes see colors, forms, or shapes when stimulated while associative synesthetes feel a strong connection between the stimulus and the sense it triggers. Synesthesia can occur across various senses, such as hearing colors or feeling sensations in response to sounds. 
There are many types of synesthesia, including grapheme color, chromesthesia, sound color, spatial sequence, number form, auditory tactile, ordinal linguistic personification, misophonia, mirror touch, lexical gustatory, kinesthetic, and more, with over 80 different types identified. While the exact neural mechanisms of synesthesia are not fully understood, it's believed to involve increased crosstalk between specialized brain regions. Some synesthetes may even experience synesthesia temporarily under specific conditions like deep concentration or during psychedelic experiences. Genetics may play a role in synesthesia as it tends to run in families, but the exact genetic basis is still unclear. Synesthesia does not typically interfere with daily functioning and is often considered a unique and sometimes advantageous way of perceiving the world. Prevalence estimates of synesthesia vary, but it's believed to affect a small percentage of the population. The most common forms are those involving color perception, with grapheme color synesthesia being the most prevalent among synesthetes. Women are more likely to have synesthesia than men. The history of synesthesia research dates back to ancient Greece, with philosophers pondering the relationship between color and music. Early medical descriptions emerged in the 19th century, and research waned in the mid-20th century, but experienced a resurgence in the late 20th century. Today synesthesia is a subject of scientific study, and has led to the formation of synesthesia organizations and communities worldwide. Hilbert's paradox of the Grand Hotel is a fascinating thought experiment revealing the peculiar nature of infinite sets. Imagine a hotel with an infinite number of rooms, each initially occupied. Surprisingly, even if infinitely more guests arrive, there's always room for everyone. To accommodate more guests, we can shift every current guest to the next room. When a new guest arrives, the first room becomes vacant. This process works for any finite number of newcomers. Even an infinite number of new guests can be accommodated. By doubling each guest's room number, all the odd-numbered rooms become available for new arrivals. Intriguingly, you can extend this concept to accommodate countably infinite coachloads of passengers. Various methods like prime powers or interleaving ensure that every guest has a unique room. Now picture an extraordinary scenario. An infinite number of ferries, each carrying infinite coaches with infinite passengers. This involves multiple levels of infinity. The previous methods can be expanded by introducing new primes or increasing exponentiation to assign rooms. Anticipating limitless layers of infinite guests, the hotel can employ binary representation. This ensures every room can be filled, even with ever-growing arrivals. However, when dealing with an infinite number of nested infinities, the same problem-solving doesn't always apply. This paradox showcases the intriguing world of infinite collections, where intuition can lead us astray. It's a reminder of the curious and paradoxical nature of infinity in mathematics. The Mozart effect is a theory suggesting that listening to Mozart's music may temporarily improve performance on specific mental tasks, particularly those related to spatial reasoning. It gained popularity with the idea that listening to Mozart makes you smarter, or benefits early childhood mental development. The original 1993 study found a short-lived boost in spatial reasoning after listening to Mozart's music. However, this got exaggerated in the media, leading to the misconception that Mozart enhances general intelligence, especially in children. This led to the commercialization of Mozart CDs for kids. Meta-analyses of subsequent studies have shown little evidence of Mozart's music having a significant impact on spatial reasoning or general IQ. The original study's author emphasized that listening to Mozart doesn't affect overall intelligence. Francis Rauscher, Gordon Shaw, and Catherine Key conducted the original study, which only showed a temporary improvement in spatial reasoning, not a boost in general IQ. The popularization of the Mozart effect led to widespread misconceptions. Even though the study focused on spatial intelligence, it was often interpreted as a general increase in IQ. The Mozart effect theory was presented in books like The Mozart Effect, Tapping the Power of Music to Heal the Body, Strengthen the Mind, and Unlock the Creative Spirit by Don Campbell. 
These theories remain controversial in scientific circles. The political impact of the theory was evident when the governor of Georgia proposed budgeting for classical music tapes or CDs for children, claiming that it enhances spatial temporal reasoning. Subsequent research has yielded mixed results, with some studies suggesting short-term effects related to mood enhancement and arousal rather than intelligence. The idea of a Mozart effect has been challenged. Claims of Mozart's music boosting intelligence are not supported by strong scientific evidence. A German report suggested that music lessons might have long-term effects on IQ, but not passive listening. The original researchers disclaimed the idea that Mozart makes you smarter. They stated that the effect is limited to spatial temporal tasks and doesn't influence general intelligence. While music has been evaluated for potential health benefits, such as decreasing epileptiform activity, scientific robustness of the Mozart effect remains disputed. Other studies explored various uses of music, including its links to seizure onset and its effects on animal learning. The original concept of the Mozart effect continues to influence public perception. Alfred A. Tomatis used the term Mozart effect in his research on ear retraining and brain development through music, but not necessarily on intelligence enhancement. Nemesis, a hypothetical star or brown dwarf, was suggested in 1984 to explain a pattern of mass extinctions occurring roughly every 26 million years in Earth's geological record. It was theorized to be located far beyond the Oort cloud, about 1.5 light years from the Sun. Recent studies have cast doubt on the existence of Nemesis. Some propose that other factors like the close passage of stars or gravitational effects from the galactic plane could be responsible for orbital disruptions in the outer solar system. The periodicity of mass extinctions identified in 1984 initially hinted at a non-terrestrial cause. However, subsequent research questioned this, and the Nemesis hypothesis lost support. Several astronomers independently suggested the Nemesis hypothesis to explain the extinction periodicity. It posited that the Sun might have an unseen companion star in a highly elliptical orbit, disturbing comets in the Oort cloud, leading to increased impacts on Earth. If Nemesis exists, it could be a red dwarf or brown dwarf, but its exact nature remains uncertain. Modern telescopes have not detected it. Alternative theories have emerged. Sedna, a distant object with an unusual orbit, initially sparked the search for Nemesis. However, the existence of a massive unseen object is now less likely, and other explanations, like passing stars, are considered. Searches for Nemesis in the infrared spectrum, which is where cooler stars shine brightly, have not been successful. Advanced surveys like WISE were expected to find it but didn't. While some data supported the periodicity of mass extinctions, it did not align with the expected irregular orbit of Nemesis. As a result, the Nemesis hypothesis has lost favor among scientists, and other explanations for mass extinctions are being explored. The ship of Theseus is a thought experiment that questions whether an object, which has had all its original parts replaced, remains the same object. Legend has it that Theseus, the ancient Greek founder king of Athens, sailed on a ship to Delos annually. Over centuries, as parts of the ship decayed, Athenians replaced them, sparking a philosophical debate. Was it still the same ship? In contemporary philosophy, this puzzle explores the concept of identity over time and has led to various proposed solutions. One popular idea suggests that the ship's material and the ship itself are distinct entities coexisting in the same space. Another theory, proposed by David Lewis, suggests dividing all objects into distinct time slices, avoiding the issue of coexisting ships by considering them as distinct across all points in time. From a cognitive science perspective, the ship of Theseus conundrum arises from the assumption that what we perceive in our minds reflects reality. This assumption can be questioned, as human intuition can be misleading. Some cognitive scientists view the ship as an organizational structure with perceptual continuity rather than a fixed object. Similar puzzles exist worldwide, like the tale of knives with replaced blades and handles, 
France's Genot's knife, Spain's family knife proverb, and Hungary's Lajos Kosuth's pocket knife. Japan's Eyes Grand Shrine is rebuilt every 20 years using new wood, but maintains continuity from the sacred forest source. Ancient texts like the Da Jidu Lun present similar philosophical puzzles such as a traveler who undergoes body part replacement by demons, leading to identity confusion. Even the USS Constitution, an American battleship, is considered a modern ship of Theseus with few or no original elements due to extensive repairs and reconstructions. In essence, the ship of Theseus challenges our understanding of identity and continuity, offering various perspectives on an intriguing philosophical puzzle. The trolley problem is a thought experiment in ethics and psychology. It involves scenarios where a runaway trolley is headed towards several people, and you have to decide whether to intervene and divert it to save more people at the cost of sacrificing one person. These dilemmas are sensitive to details that may seem unimportant. The central question is why people make different judgments in different versions of the story. One basic scenario is called bystander at the switch. You can either do nothing, letting the trolley kill five people, or pull a lever to divert it, killing one person. The ethical choice is debated. The trolley problem's origins date back to 1905 and have been discussed in various forms over the years. It gained prominence in philosophy through works by Philippa Foote and Judith Jarvis Thompson. It's been used in empirical research on moral psychology since 2001. Studies show that people's responses vary based on emotional engagement and reasoning. Surveys indicate that around 90% of respondents would sacrifice one person to save five, but this changes when the one sacrificed is a relative or romantic partner. Critics argue that the trolley problem is too extreme and disconnected from real-life moral situations. They question its usefulness and its impact on human empathy. The dilemma also has implications for the ethics of autonomous vehicles. Should software prioritize the safety of the car's occupants or potential victims outside? It's a complex issue that involves legal and ethical considerations. In 2016, the German government appointed a commission to study the ethical implications of autonomous driving and adopted rules to govern the ethical choices of autonomous vehicles. Phaeton, a hypothetical planet, was once suggested to exist between Mars and Jupiter. This idea came from the Titius Bode Law, which proposed a pattern in planetary spacing. Ceres, later classified as a dwarf planet, was found in 1801 and initially believed to be this missing planet. However, more asteroids like Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were discovered, leading to a theory that a planet had broken apart. In 1927, Franz Xaver Kugler proposed that the myth of Phaethon was inspired by a real event. He argued that a bright celestial object around 1500 BC fell to Earth as a meteorite shower, causing catastrophic fires and floods. The disruption theory suggests that Phaeton could have been destroyed in various ways, like getting too close to Jupiter, colliding with another celestial body, or being shattered from within. Soviet astronomer Ivan Brintan, Putilin proposed in 1953 that centrifugal forces caused Phaeton to distort and lose parts, which later formed the asteroid belt. However, this theory was not widely accepted. Another idea in 1955 by Konstantin N. Savchenko suggested that Cirrus, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were once moons of Phaeton. One of these moons escaped and eventually collided with Phaeton, breaking it apart. Over the years, many scientists supported the disrupted planet hypothesis, believing that Phaeton could have been a gas giant similar to Saturn. Today, the prevailing belief is the accretion model, where asteroids in the main belt are remnants of the protoplanetary disk that never formed a planet due to Jupiter's gravitational disturbances. Some unconventional theories like Zecharia Sitchin's and Tom Van Flandern's suggest alternative scenarios for Phaeton's existence and destruction. In fiction, several works feature a planet, often named Phaeton or Maldek, once located between Mars and Jupiter, which eventually became the asteroid belt. Empathy, a concept rooted in human understanding, encompasses various dimensions. 
Its English term comes from the ancient Greek word empatheia, meaning physical affection or passion. This word comprises en, in at, and pathos, passion or suffering. The concept of empathy has evolved over time and includes multiple definitions. Empathy encompasses a wide range of phenomena, including caring for others, experiencing emotions matching another's, discerning their thoughts and emotions, and blurring the line between self and others. The characterization of empathy depends on how emotions are defined. It can involve recognizing bodily feelings in others or understanding their beliefs and desires. Empathy isn't an all-or-nothing trait. Individuals can vary in their empathic abilities. It often involves accurately recognizing another person's intentional actions, emotions, and characteristics. This capacity to recognize the bodily feelings of others relates to our innate ability to associate observed movements and expressions with our own proprioceptive feelings. Compassion, sympathy, pity, and emotional contagion are related to empathy. Compassion motivates helping others, while sympathy reflects care and understanding for those in need. Pity is akin to feeling sorry for someone, and emotional contagion involves imitatively catching others' emotions. Empathy comprises effective empathy, emotional, and cognitive empathy, understanding another's perspective. Effective empathy involves responding with appropriate emotions to someone's mental states and can be further divided into empathic concern, personal distress, and effective mentalizing. Cognitive empathy focuses on understanding another's perspective and includes perspective-taking, fantasy, tactical empathy, and emotion regulation. Empathy is a complex construct, with distinctions like behavioral empathy and social empathy. Fritz Breithaupt highlights the importance of empathy suppression mechanisms in healthy empathy. Empathy is not exclusive to humans. It's observed in animals like primates and rodents. Empathy's evolutionary and ontogenetic development suggests that children start showing signs of empathy around two years of age, evolving as they grow. Autism is linked to difficulties with empathy and theory of mind. Empathy can vary among individuals, influenced by factors like extroversion and agreeableness. Sex differences in empathy exist, with females generally scoring higher than males. However, some studies suggest that these differences are influenced by motivations and social environments. Environmental factors, including parenting style and prior social experiences, can influence empathy development in children. Brain trauma, particularly on the right side of the brain or the frontal lobe, can impair empathy. Evidence suggests that empathy is a skill that can be improved through training. Empathic anger and distress are two related emotions. Empathic anger is a reaction to someone else's suffering, affecting desires to help or punish. Empathic distress involves feeling another person's pain, which can lead to emotions like empathic anger, feelings of injustice, or guilt. Stoic philosophers argued that conditioning one's emotional state on others' emotions or fortunes is unwise. Ideasthesia is when thinking about ideas makes you feel something like a sense experience. It's not exactly like synesthesia, where your senses get mixed up. Instead, in ideasthesia, only the feeling you get is like a sense, and it happens because of the meaning of the idea. For example, in a type of ideasthesia called grapheme color synesthesia, letters or numbers have colors not because they look a certain way, but because of what they mean. So, if you see the symbol 5, it might be red or blue, depending on whether you think of it as a letter or a number. Ideasthesia isn't just about synesthesia. It happens in everyday life, too. For instance, just thinking about a swimming style can make you feel a certain color, even if you're not actually swimming. There's also something called one-shot synesthesia, which is when you have a unique experience during deep thinking. This is also a type of ideasthesia. In regular thinking, there's a cool thing called the booba kiki phenomenon. Most people think the word kiki goes with a spiky, star-shaped image, and booba goes with a round, soft image. This happens because our brain connects words with meanings, and those meanings make us feel things in our senses. Ideasthesia is useful for kids to understand abstract ideas and has something to do with art and how we appreciate it. 
It also helps us see that art is different for everyone because it's connected to our unique experiences and knowledge. In our brain, ideasthesia fits with the idea that concepts are essential for how our brain works. Studies show that when we experience colors through ideasthesia, it's a bit slower than seeing colors directly, which supports the idea that it's connected to meanings in our brain. In mathematics, a fractal is a unique kind of geometric shape that appears intricate and complex at all levels of magnification. Unlike regular shapes, where scaling up by a factor doubles the area, like a square, or triples the volume, like a cube, fractals scale differently. When you double the size of a fractal in any dimension, the space it occupies scales by a power that isn't necessarily a whole number. This scaling property is described by the fractal dimension. Fractals often exhibit self-similarity, which means they have patterns that repeat themselves at different scales. This self-similarity can be exact, the same pattern at all scales, or approximate, similar, but not identical patterns. Fractal geometry is a part of mathematics that deals with these unique shapes and patterns. Fractals have interesting characteristics like being nowhere differentiable, meaning they have irregular and jagged structures. This property makes it challenging to measure their length or area using traditional methods as they would require infinite precision. The concept of fractals has a rich history from early ideas about recursive patterns in the 17th century to modern computer-generated visualizations. Benoit Mandelbrot coined the term fractal in 1975 and introduced it to describe objects with a hausdorff besikovic dimension greater than their topological dimension. Over time, the definition of fractals has evolved, but they are generally characterized by self-similarity, fine structure at all scales, and irregularity that defies simple geometric descriptions. Fractals find applications in various fields, including art, computer graphics, physics, biology, and more. They help us model and understand complex natural phenomena with fractal features such as coastlines, clouds, blood vessels, and even the structure of neurons. Psychonautics is a term that refers to the exploration of altered or non-ordinary states of consciousness. This exploration often involves methods like meditation and the use of hallucinogenic substances. The goal is to gain a deeper understanding of the human psyche and the unconscious mind. The word psychonaut is used to describe a person who engages in this kind of exploration. It's derived from Greek words that mean soul or mind and sailor, or navigator. Psychonauts use various methods for their explorations including meditation, yoga, lucid dreaming, sensory deprivation, and controlled use of hallucinogenic substances like mushrooms or LSD. It's important to note that psychonautics is distinct from recreational drug use. While mind-altering substances are sometimes used, the focus is on self-exploration, personal growth, and often has a spiritual or research purpose. Recreational drug use, on the other hand, is primarily for pleasure or socializing. Methods used in psychonautics can include psychoactive substance use, meditation, yoga, dream exploration, aeronautics, rituals, trances, sensory deprivation, fasting, sleep deprivation, and even oxygen deprivation through techniques like holotropic breathwork. Holotropic breathwork, HB, is a practice that involves controlled and rapid breathing to influence mental, emotional, and physical states. Developed in the 1970s by psychiatrists Stanislav and Christina Groff, it aims to achieve altered states of consciousness without drugs. The primary premise of HB is that healing comes from within the person practicing it. During a session, participants breathe rapidly and evenly to induce an altered state, often described as a more intense form of meditation. HB is practiced in a group setting, with one person actively practicing while another sits as a support. The facilitator guides the session, instructing breathers to breathe faster and deeper while keeping their eyes closed. Repetitive music is played to aid in entering an altered state. The session is open-ended, allowing participants to derive their own meaning and self-discovery. 
Afterward, participants discuss their experiences, which can range from re-experiencing trauma to spiritual awareness. The benefits of HB include relaxation, stress relief, personal growth, and self-awareness. However, research supporting its therapeutic benefits for psychiatric conditions is limited. Potential risks include distress in vulnerable individuals and medical risks associated with hyperventilation. It's recommended to undertake HB alongside traditional therapy rather than as a replacement. Machine elves, also known as fractal elves or self-transforming elf machines, are entities often reported by individuals using tryptamine-based psychedelic drugs, particularly DMT. These encounters have been documented in various cultures, including Native American and African tribal traditions, as well as among Western users of these substances. During a DMT trip, individuals may enter a unique realm where they encounter these entities. Described by Terence McKenna, these machine elves are likened to jeweled self-dribbling basketballs that welcome and engage with the person. They create intricate, impossible objects through their voices, urging the individual to pay attention to their actions. These entities seem insistent that the person should join in and create as they do. It's worth noting that this phenomenon may be related to altered states of consciousness that lead the brain to imagine living entities. For instance, sleep paralysis often gives rise to a sense of a living presence. However, McKenna and Dr. Rick Strassman believe that the reality of the experience is distinct from ordinary hallucinations and might involve the physics of many worlds or interdimensional elements. Another perspective by James Kent suggests that DMT disrupts the brain's processing of visual information, leading to chaotic interpretations that may include humanoid figures like machine elves. This interpretation arises from the brain's tendency to anthropomorphize abstract stimuli. Sacred geometry attributes special meanings to certain geometric shapes and proportions. It's linked to the belief in a divine creator who uses geometry in the design of the universe. This concept has ancient origins and can be found in various cultures. Geometry has been associated with religious structures like churches and temples. Some believe that it holds spiritual significance and influences the harmony between humans and nature. In Buddhism, mandalas, composed of geometric shapes, play a crucial role. They are believed to house deities and provide positive energy to those who observe them. Mandalas can be created with sand and then ritually destroyed to symbolize impermanence. In Chinese folk religion, feng shui principles use specific geometric shapes, like rectangles and squares, in architectural design to optimize the flow of life energy, qi, for harmony. Islamic art and architecture feature intricate geometric patterns based on combinations of squares and circles. These patterns are seen in various art forms and religious contexts. Hinduism incorporates sacred geometry in temple construction. The temple's design follows the principle of self-similarity, resembling fractal patterns found in nature. In Christianity, medieval cathedrals were constructed using geometries to symbolize divine understanding. The circle represented nature's perfection, while microcosmic analogies related to the universe were explored. Quantum mechanics is like a set of rules for how the tiniest things in our world, like atoms and particles, behave. It's different from the regular rules we know from everyday life. In quantum mechanics, these tiny things can act like both waves and tiny particles at the same time. They also don't have exact properties like we're used to. Instead of saying, this is exactly where it is, we have to talk about the chance of finding it in different places. Imagine you have a tiny particle like a speck of dust. In quantum mechanics, we can't say exactly where it is or how fast it's moving at the same time. There's always a bit of uncertainty. Sometimes these tiny particles can do strange things. They can act like they're in two places at once or pass through barriers that they shouldn't be able to. It's a bit like magic. There's also something called entanglement. When particles are entangled, they become connected in a mysterious way. Even if you separate them, they still act as if they're linked. Quantum mechanics involves some complicated math, but it's like a special language to understand these tiny things better. 
One important rule is the uncertainty principle. It says that we can't know both exactly where a particle is and how fast it's going at the same time. There's always a trade-off. In quantum mechanics, when you have two tiny things together, they can become entangled and it's hard to describe them individually. They become like a team where you can't talk about one without the other. There are different ways to describe quantum mechanics like using math or thinking about paths particles can take. Lastly, quantum mechanics has a connection to symmetry, which means when things stay the same even if you change something about them. In quantum mechanics, if something doesn't change over time, like an object's speed or position, it's called conserved 